welcome uh, everyone to the four uh, IC lecture series. Um, we're lucky enough to be able to uh, uh, welcome Steve Marshek for a series of three lectures. First one today entitled Building Stuff. Uh, the second one on October 27th entitled Precious Stuff and one in November, November 17th called Burning Stuff. The overall title for the lecture series is Where Stuff Comes From, Earth's Resources and Sustainability. No one better than uh, Professor Steve Marshak to um, illuminate uh, the questions of where stuff comes from. He was on the Faculty of Geology at the University of Illinois for 35 years, served as Department Head of Geology, and was until recently the director of the School for Earth Society uh, and Environment. He's also a textbook author extraordinaire, and literally thousands of geology students across the English speaking world have been introduced to the uh, amazing world of geology through, uh, through Steve's uh, masterful uh, textbooks. So uh, without further ado, we're lucky to have Steve and I'd like, um, like to welcome him to the virtual dais uh, to give his, his first lecture um, called Building Stuff, Materials from the Earth that Sustain Our Built Environment from Ancient Coral to City Sidewalks. Welcome, Steve. Thanks very much, Gillen. Um, it's a real pleasure to have an opportunity to do this presentation today. Um, it derives from a course that I, I used to teach on Earth resources, and uh, I, I feel that it's relevant to a lot of discussion pertaining to sustainability and environmental issues because a lot of times um, we forget that, that the built environment isn't uh, just the energy nexus, energy, food and, and uh, uh, water nexus, but also includes a lot of other materials. Um, you know, if you were to zoom in, for example, on New York City, um, just take an average street scene, you'd see an awful lot of materials that are derived from the earth that uh, are essential for supporting our modern built environment. You know, just look around you and you'll see bricks and wallboard and plaster and copper wires and stone and glass and iron, uh, steel, aluminum, lithium, plastic. All of these things are basically earth materials. And um, to discuss them, I divided our, our course, or our, our short, short course, into three different basic areas. Uh, we're going to be looking at metallic materials at one point. Um, organic materials such as oil and gas and tar that, that uh, are primarily important for our energy, energy, energy industry. But today I wanna to focus in on non-metallic materials, uh, things like stone, clay, sand, stuff that we often just take for granted, but again, um, is absolutely essential for our modern environment. One thing is uh, you'll see during the course of this, um, that there are various credits on each slide. SM are, are photos that I took, uh, book, is from Earth Portrait of the Planet. And then there are a lot of images that are just unattributed screen grabs that I took from the web. And so I do worry a little bit about copyright issues. Um, hopefully it's not a problem under fair use. Anyway, let's get started. Um, point out that we use large amounts of non-metallic earth materials. In fact, if you look at, at our usage of things like stone and gravel and cement and so forth, um, these circles represent the proportions. We use vastly more of that kind of material than we do of perhaps other materials such as iron and steel or aluminum, which we might think of when we think of earth resources. Obviously, I'm not gonna have time to talk about all of these things today. So I'm gonna just focus in on, on five of them. Uh, and I may or may not have time for the last one. Uh, we're gonna discuss salt, clay, concrete, dimension stone, which are basically building blocks, and sand. These are, at first glance, you might think of boring subjects because uh, again, we take them for granted, but in fact, uh, try to think about where they come from and, and why we can obtain them and what issues are, for, are, are there pertaining to their sustainability are actually pretty fascinating. So let's start with salt. Um, salt's been around a long time, obviously, as, as a human resource. In fact, it was one of the first items that people used to, uh, to trade. Um, in fact, the word salary comes from the Latin word sal, because sometimes Russian, or not Russian, uh, Roman soldiers were paid in salt. Um, traditionally, it's been used for many purposes, ranging from preserving fish and meat to just as a condiment, 
And of course, these days up in the northern part of the country, uh, we use it for melting ice and snow. Though, of course, there's less ice and snow around these days. Um, so where did it come from? Well, basically, salt is simply halite, mineral sodium chloride. And if you go back one step further and wonder where the ions that make up sodium chloride come from, you'll see that the sodium comes from basically the weathering of minerals. If you were to take a, a typical rock like a granite, you would find that about 3% of that rock is composed of sodium that's bonded to other elements to form familiar minerals, such as feldspar. The chloride comes primarily from acidic volcanic glasses, because in the volcanic gases, because in fact, um, gases that come out of a volcano often include dilute concentrations of hydrochloric acid. Now, I use the word weathering just as an aside in case you're not familiar with geological terms. I, I'm assuming that not everybody in this, in this uh, listening to this presentation has had geology. Uh, weathering is basically the breakdown of rock at the Earth's surface, and we divide it into two types, chemical, which results from the reaction of, of minerals with water or air, or physical, which is simply the physical breakdown, like when, when rock fractures and cracks and disaggregates. Now, sodium chloride, the ions in sodium chloride are coming primarily from the chemical weathering process. And in the case of sodium, rivers eventually carry dissolved sodium down to the ocean where it's got nowhere else to go, so it stays there and bonds with the chloride to form salt. So that's where salt comes from. Now, if we were to use salt from salt water, we could. It would take a lot of energy because we'd have to boil away the water, or we let nature do it in various ways. So basically where we get salt from are places where water naturally gets, in almost all cases I should say, are places where water gets naturally supersaturated. So the salt precipitates out of it. The sodium ions and chloride ions come together and form solid halite crystals that settle out. This happens in a lot of places. Um, it can happen where you have evaporation of seawater or salt lake water. Uh, sometimes you'll have brines that are dissolving salt deeper, deeper in the earth and they come out, they can be evaporated and made uh, into salt. And then um, you'll see a lot of it comes from gigantic underground salt mines where nature concentrated salt over millions of years and formed it into layers that we can now access. So let's look at this. So here's the whole concept of evaporating salt water. Um, in some warm ocean bodies uh, where you have a lot of evaporation, you can precipitate out salt along the edge. Uh, obviously, along salt lakes, like the Great Salt Lake in, in, uh, in um, the Western United States, you can have precipitation of salt. What we're looking at here actually is salt precipitating from a salt lake in Death Valley uh, with the mountains in the background. All that white that's on the muddy brown clay that's beneath it is salt. We can collect that salt by uh, piling it in piles and then extracting it. Um, but a lot of times, the salt that you, you obtain just by making a pile of what's evaporated on the ground is actually a mixture of halite plus various other kinds of salts like gypsum or anhydrite, other minerals that you have heard, heard of. So in order to get salt of the right kind, the evaporation often has to be taking place under controlled conditions so that just the right of, amount of saturation takes place so you precipitate out the minerals that you want. So often a commercial salt producing um, facility has water coming in, evaporating progressively more and more and more until finally you've got crystallization of the right minerals and then that can be manufactured. Often it's cleaned and dried and then piled and carried elsewhere. Notice that, that one of the things about this is salt is coming from the earth. So this is an example of an earth resource that, that we take for granted but is really significant for society. Modern salt production facilities sometimes are pretty big. Um, these are evaporating pools in an area where there's salt water available. Um, in some parts of the world, the salt is collected from these pools by, by workers working by hand. Um, out here in Utah, uh, next to the Great Salt Lake, uh, it's, it's mechanized. All that white stuff is salt. Um, but it's not the only source. There are places where brine springs bubble up water that's been uh, made salty by reaction with rock under the ground, and that can be boiled away and turned into salt. But a lot of the big salt supplies come from ancient deposits, ancient beds of salt that accumulated over millions of years, in some cases millions to hundreds of millions of years ago. 
um, in, the, in the picture that we're looking up at the upper left, what you're actually seeing is a, a cliff cut into the salt or a cave cut into salt. And these horizontal layers are the individual beds, indicating that this was a period of time when salt accumulated, then there was a break in deposition, then there's another period of time when salt accumulated, break in deposition, and so forth, layer upon layer upon layer of salt. Um, it's, it's accessed by underground salt, um, where people pretty much just carve into the salt and, uh, and, and extract it. These are a little bit tricky to build because salt is a very weak material, very weak rock. And uh, so care has to be taken that you don't end up uh, with the salt collapsing or flowing into open spaces. But sometimes these salt mines are just phenomenally large. And again, you can see the layering, the stripes on the side are, are basically just the layers of, uh, of salt, not, not the big ones necessarily, that's related to production. With these little stripes that you're seeing here. This one's big enough that there's a salt field in it. Uh, here's an example of, of um, salt mining. You'll notice that it's underground, there are big grooms in here, and then these pillars are left behind to hold up the roof. And then all of these little black things here are rock bolts that are, are basically bolting to hold the salt or hold the roof of the, uh, the chamber open so it doesn't collapse. Another example of salt mining. And again, you can see the bedding of the salt. So you might wonder then, where does that salt come from? Why, why do we have these thick layers of salt under, underground? Well, it's because the earth changes over time. Um, we talk a lot about global change now, but, but uh, global change is in fact nothing new. It's been happening since the, the birth of the planet four and a half billion years ago. And there were times in the, uh, in the past, like in the Silurian, a couple hundred, few hundred years ago, when sea level was much higher than it is relative to the land today. And because of it, large areas of, of uh, continents actually flooded with shallow seas. You can see that the, the, in this reconstruction of paleogeography, the, the way the Earth looked at looked like at times in the past, you can see that at this time, uh, Illinois, which is right there, was, was submerged beneath a shallow sea. Now, it so happens that, that after these deposits, or sometimes simultaneously with these deposits, there have been movements of the surface of the continental crust, a layer forms the outer layer of the earth. And it has warped the sedimentary layers of the mid-continent mid into these giant arches, basins, and domes. These, uh, the arches are basically like uh, long arch-shaped um, geometries where the layers are, are warped downwards on the side. Domes are like overturned bowls and basins are like upright bowls. Well, let's take a closer look at the Michigan Basin because what we're seeing here in red is the distribution of Silurian deposits. So if we make a vertical cross section, a slice through the earth right about there, this is what it looks like. This is the downward warp of the Michigan Basin. And you can see the layer of Silurian, which contains the salt, is exposed near the surface on the northwest side and comes up close to the surface again on the southeast side. And it's this layer that people are digging into to gain access to these ancient layers or beds of salt. Turns out though that the thickest deposits of salt in the world are, are not within continents, but are along the edges of continents, places that are called passive margins. Now, just as a, a, a quick review, in case you haven't had a geology course or, or haven't had one recently, the Earth's outer layer, which is called the lithosphere, it's kind of the hard shell of the Earth, is actually not continuous, but has broken into a variety of, is broken into a variety of different pieces that are called plates. And these plates move relative to one another. So here we are in the North American plate, which includes the continent of North America and the western half of the Atlantic Ocean, bounded on the east by a plate boundary, and bounded on the south by a plate boundary, and bounded on the west by a plate boundary. But you'll notice that the eastern and southern edges of North America are not plate boundaries. The plate activity, the motion's all being accommodated way out here in the middle of the Atlantic. Nothing much is going on along these coasts. So they're called passive margins. Kind of implies that there are no earthquakes going on very often, or I should say there are very infrequent earthquakes there relative to where a plate boundary is. Well, if we were to make a vertical slice through one of these passive margins, it would look something like this, with the continental crust, the uppermost layer, being stretched where it connects with the oceanic crust that underlies the ocean. And it's in this area of stretching where a space was created 
for a lot of sediment to be accumulating. Some of that sediment washes in from the continents, some of it settles out of the ocean, and some of it at an early stage was precipitated from salt lakes. So let's look at this area and how it evolves. Start out with, with a, a continent that's pretty much intact, but then for reasons I don't have time to discuss today, it starts getting stretched apart and it starts to break. Eventually, in this time two block, it breaks enough that it's thinned and the center part starts to sink. And when that happens, uh, the sea will, will come in. And when sea levels are high, the, the area will flood. When sea level drops, the area dries out, but the salt that was in the water gets left behind. Eventually, the continents breaks apart entirely. entirely. This is a, a process called rifting. And you end up with one half of this rift underneath the margin of one continent and the other half underneath the margin of the other continent. And it's in this area right here that the salt deposits that were precipitated in these lakes and in shallow seas accumulate. So let's zoom in on that area. Here's a cross section, a vertical slice through that area. The black represents the salt. Salt's really weak. So under the weight of the overlying sediment, it gradually gives way and the sediment breaks apart and starts sliding. And uh, these blocks slowly slip towards the sea. And they also push the salt up towards the sea. So if we zoom in on that area, we see something like this, where these blocks have settled down. And when they drop down, there's less weight here. So salt rises and some of the salt gets pushed seaward and wrinkles up into a series of complicated folds or, or uh, uh, structures that are out near, near the shore. Okay, now let's look at where this occurred, what this looks like in three dimensions. So here's what it looks like in three dimensions. There's this irregular salt layer, which is flowing, and it causes the layers of sediment that were deposited above to warp into little bowls and basins and complicated forms. Where do you see this? Well, let's go to the southern part of the United States, the Gulf Coast. Off here, you can see those bumps and dimples exposed. They're buried up here by a younger sediment, but down here, we can see them exposed. In fact, this whole area, which is also the area where offshore drilling uh, takes place for oil deposits, is gradually sliding seawards as if it's a, a big pile of molasses, but it's only moving at rates of a few millimeters to maybe a centimeter a year. So you don't notice it from year to year, but it's, it's moving. If we zoom in on that area, this is what it looks like. And you can see the texture of that due to the mobility of the salt underneath, creating all sorts of complicated salt domes and canopies and things like that. Here's what it looks like even closer. So we've seen that, that salt, major resource, one of the earliest resources used in trade, uh, comes from evaporated seawater primarily, sometimes from brines. Um, sometimes we collect it along the margins of salty waters, bodies of water. Sometimes we use deposits that were accumulating in the past and are buried in the rock record. One, one other point while I'm, before I leave the subject of salts in general, I mentioned that, that salt water actually contains lots of other ions besides just sodium and chloride. So other salts deposit. And one of those is, is gypsum. And gypsum accumulates in huge layers, and it's another resource that we rely on. Again, you can mine it underground, you can mine it at the surface, you get a sense of what a mine looks like. These are big places where the earth surface has been changed a lot by the process of resource extraction. Sorry about that. But what we use that for is sheetrock or wallboard. What you do is you mix it with water, pour it between two sheets of paper, let it dry, and slice it, and you end up with this stuff, which is what makes the walls of most of our houses. Okay, so we've talked about salt, and a little bit about gypsum. Now let's turn our attention to clay, which is essential for bricks and ceramics and basically starts out as mud. But let's look a little bit further back into it. Clay has you know, been around for a long time and has been used by society for a long time. Even way back when, it was used for pottery, for brick making, uh, for construction, all sorts of uses. Where does it come from? Well, the, the fundamental component of pottery and bricks is clay. And clay is a general term for extremely fine-grained minerals, including a, a set of minerals that we'll talk about in a second called clay minerals, but also sometimes very small grains of quartz and, and other minerals such as feldspar. Where does this stuff come from? Well, again, it's a consequence of weathering at the surface of the earth. So you take a rock like granite, it's got certain minerals in it, 
feldspar quartz, maybe less familiar minerals such as biotite and amphibole. When it reacts with air and water at the surface of the earth, chemical reactions take place. And what they do is they react primarily with the, the feldspar and the biotite and the amphibole and turn it into a very weak mineral called clay or clay mineral. Then the rock disaggregates. And if later on it gets washed by running water or wind, the very, very fine clay flakes get carried away, leaving the sand behind. We'll see that that's important if we get a chance to talk about sand at the end of the talk. Now, um, what is clay? Well, you zoom in on it at very high magnification. It's called a phyllosilicate, just like the, the same Greek uh, root for, that's used for phyllo dough, very, very thin sheets. And that's because it has a mineral structure that's composed of sheets that are bonded together by weak ions or weak bonds. And so it looks like little sheets of paper, only these are so small, you can't even see them with a regular microscope. You have to use an electron microscope to see them. If you tried with a regular microscope, you just see this sort of messy looking stuff that's hard to understand. But if you zoomed in, again, it's composed of these tiny little sheets. Those are clay minerals. And that's one of the key components of, of clay. There's also, like I say, tiny bits of quartz and feldspar mixed in. Now, clay, being that it's so fine grain, gets deposited only in very quiet water. So here we're seeing clay bank along a quiet, free flowing river when, when the, the tide's gone out a little bit. This is the Thames in, in the UK. Um, when it dries, it cracks to form mud cracks. Um, it's got, you may have seen these in a mud puddle that dries out. But uh, for commercial purposes, clay is not obtained from recent piles of mud, but actually from ancient deposits that have, have compacted and dried out a bit. Um, if places like clay pits or clay quarries, this is a huge amount of clay due to the weathering over a very long time of appropriate rock types, and now it's being quarried. Once you have the clay out, you, uh, you can either by hand sift out the coarser grains, um, or it can be done by machine, and then you mix it with water, let it settle out, and then this is the, the nice clean mud that can be used for brick making either by hand or in a factory. Now, if we go back to this slide, what we're seeing here is basically our brick, what we're seeing are bricks that are made out of clay that's just allowed to dry. And when the clay dries, it becomes pretty hard. You can make, it, you can make houses out of it, but those houses are not gonna be very durable in wet climates because the clay will rehydrate and start to, to weaken. Also over time, it's, it's just not a very strong material so it breaks apart because clay basically is, by its character is a very weak material. What happens in modern society is that clay is baked in a kiln. It takes a lot of energy because you've got to have a very hot fire to do this. Um, but these kilns, this is an old one back from the 19th century. Of course, there are much moder more modern ones now. But what the, the heat does is it causes a process that geologists refer to as metamorphism, from the same word as metamorphosis from the Greek to change. What, that, what happens is under the application of heat, it's not enough heat to make it melt in general, but what it does is it causes the crystals to recrystallize so that they eventually become bigger crystals and they interlock with one another, making a much stronger material. And that's what makes very, very hard bricks like the commercial ones that we see today. Uh, obviously, brick making in industrialized countries is now done in giant factories, but uh, it's the same end product. What about pottery? Same idea. Um, you start with a, a clay material that's usually 45% kaolinite, which is a type of clay mineral, plus some quartz and feldspar. You heat it up um, and it, you heat it to a certain temperature below 1200 degrees, it becomes earthenware. Above 1200 degrees, it sort of partially melts and then freezes again and becomes more glassy and porcelain, and becomes porcelain. Um, yeah, here's an example of kilns. Uh, the ones on the left are, are kilns in China. The ones on the right is a, a modern pottery kiln um, in, the, in a U.S. pottery factory. Okay, so salt, clay, what about concrete? This is a more complicated material. It's going to take us a while to discuss it. Basically, concrete, the stuff that makes sidewalks, the stuff that makes the floors of the building that you're probably in, um, the, the stuff that, that makes the walls of, of buildings, is a mixture of cement, 
which is a binder that's composed of minerals that binds together other things, and aggregate, which is basically gravel and sand. So basically concrete is a, is a pile of aggregate mixed with cement that then hardens so that the cement holds together the aggregate. So the, the question then is, if you ask what cement is, is really, or what um, concrete is, you have to first ask the question, what cement? And uh, again, chemically, it's, it's a, a mixture of various oxide compounds, such as calcium oxide, silica, iron oxide, and aluminum oxide. And these ions all come from rock. So when you take processed um, rock, we'll show what that is in a minute, you're basically looking at a mixture of these chemicals. And when you mix it with water and then allow it to set, those chemicals combine to form new minerals that interlock with one another and basically form a, form a jigsaw-like texture that holds together the, the blocks of sand or the grains of, I'm sorry, the grains of sand or the blocks of gravel that are in it. So concrete's been around for a while. Uh, the Greeks and Egyptians used it um, in construction. Uh, first, it was just the lime part, CaO. Um, Minoans used it by mixing crushed pottery, which is clay, in with the lime to make cement. Uh, the Romans made it out of mixing volcanic ash with lime, and then nothing much happened for the next several centuries because throughout the Middle Ages, the technology of using concrete was pretty much forgotten. Till about the 1400s, uh, Romans, uh, the Roman techniques were rediscovered and people began to use concrete again. It wasn't until the 18th and 19th century, actually most of the 19th century, modern methods of, of making concrete came into play. We'll see that that has to do with the discovery of a material called Portland cement. We'll get to that in a minute. Before that, um, in the 19th century, people discovered that there were certain rock types that naturally contained just the right mixture of those oxides. So that all you had to do was uh, dig out that rock, crush it up, put it in a kiln, heat it up, and then when you did that, you ended up with just the right ratio of oxides that when you mixed it with water and let it set, it would make a very strong concrete. That material is called natural cement. Um, there are quarries of it in many places, but they're just not, not huge amounts of it available. Um, this particular quarry is a 19th century quarry in the Hudson Valley of New York, and this was the nearby kiln. This stuff was uh, shipped down to New York City. Um, they, they burned it, made a powder out of it, and then shipped it in bags down to New York City, and that's what makes the sidewalks of, of New York. The problem is that that stuff doesn't occur everywhere. And as the Industrial Revolution took place and urbanization took place, the demand for concrete um, became greater. So uh, in the 19th century, early 19th century, uh, Joseph Aspenden um, discovered that if you mix together crushed uh, powdered rock in just the right proportion, you could end up with a material that was very, very much like natural cement. And he patented that mixture in 1824 and called it Portland cement. Um, not because it's from Portland, which is a, a city in England, but because, um, it, well, it, it looks like uh, limestone outcrops of Jurassic age that are near Portland on the south coast of England. So Portland cement can be made anywhere now where you can attain the right components, but it was originally named for a city where it was for some, uh, it was near the rock types that it was resembling. Anyway, uh, here's a close-up of a quarry in the Portland stone. This is the natural outcrop. This is bedding, the layering within it, and this was a quarry that uh, carved this room and this pillar was left to hold the quarry standing. And you can see that this cement looks very much like that. Well now, Portland cement's made by everywhere, and primarily it's made by crushing limestone and mixing it with appropriate amounts of crushed shale, not much different from the Noans mixing lime with, with crushed pottery, then putting it in a kiln to produce clinker, you crush the clinker to make the powder, and this is cement powder. Let's look at the kiln. So here's a, a kiln today out near Las Vegas, and if you look at a cross section of it, what's happening is the crushed rock is being carried up here, dumped into here, it's then dumped into this big turning cylinder, which is heated at this end by a really intense flame. And so as it goes down this inclined cylinder, as, it, as the cylinder rotates, it first dries, then it, it, it uh, breaks down and turns into, into lime. And then it comes out the other end as clinker. Now, 
that can be done at, at vast scales, and it is being done at vast scales all the way around the world. Problem with that from a sustainability standpoint is that the production of, of concrete or cement by cooking limestone produces carbon dioxide gas. Basically, limestone is the mineral calcium carbonate or calcite. When you heat it up, it breaks down to form CaO, which is the lime that's in cement, plus CO2 gas. And about 8% of global carbon dioxide emissions are actually coming from cement production. So when you look at something like a giant concrete dam, that maybe is producing green energy now because um, it's, it's making energy from, from hydroelectric power. You have to keep in mind that the construction of that dam used a lot of concrete and that concrete has a carbon footprint. So how do you use it? Well, you mix, you mix the cement with aggregate, which is crushed rock or sand, water, let it harden, and then the minerals grow, as I mentioned, to form an interlocking network. So here's a cement mixer where it's got that mixture of aggregate plus cement plus water turning around and around and around then it pours it out and, and gets spread and then molded into forms. Often rebar, iron bar, is put within it like here on a highway because that provides tensile strength. It keeps it from cracking and breaking apart. So it's a very important part of making con or concrete construction of larger entities. But if you slice into the concrete, this is what it looks like. The, Chunks here are aggregate. The finer stuff is stone and new minerals that crystallize, I'm sorry, sand and new minerals that's crystallized from cement. It's basically artificial rock. That aggregate, where does it come from? Well, crushed rock also comes from quarries. So here's a quarry not far from Champaign-Urbana um, in Illinois. This is a bunch of limestone and it's being crushed and separated in different size fractions um, right at the quarry. Uh, a lot of times these quarrying operations are pretty exciting. Um, the quarry operators will drill lots of holes, pack them with explosives, and time the explosions just right to fragment the rock into just the right sizes to be, um, to be used for their, their processing. The result is you in places you have absolutely immense quarries. Here's the, uh, the Thornton Quarry, which is up near Chicago. Up here is Interstate 80. And you can see it's just a little bit of so soil on top with bushes growing out of it. Below that is the bedrock. And in this area, the bedrock is Silurian limestone. And it has really good properties to make it useful for making crushed stone and for making concrete. Give you a sense of the scale, here's a truck. That's a big truck. It looks like that. A person comes up to the base of the top of the tire on that. And this isn't even the largest ones that, that uh, they make, but these Trucks fill up with stone, dump it into a crusher, and then it goes from there. Another view of Thornton Quarry. Again, notice that the, the, the biosphere that we're living on, the soil and everything that grows in it is really thin in comparison to, to the depth of this quarry. And you can see these things when you fly into Chicago. Here's the Thornton Quarry from the air. Um, this is Interstate 80 running along there. It's just on a bridge. You might not even notice it as you drive across it from Chicago towards Indiana but uh, you got huge holes on either side of it. These, these quarries are now being used to store excess stormwater runoff from Chicago during times of, of flooding. Where does that limestone come from? Well, again, it's from the earth, but how did it get there? Well, a lot of limestone forms um, by the, the process of, the living process of organisms. Basically, it's a biochemical rock that comes from the shells secreted by organisms. Some precipitates directly from water, but most comes from shells, such as occurs on a coral reef. Um, the reefs that were around in Silurian time look different from those today. They didn't have the same organisms, basically the same concept. And if you look at a slice through a reef, sometimes you can actually see the old reefal structures that are, are uh, indicative of mounds of, of uh, coral-like organisms that were growing in the past and built this limestone. Um, if you take a sample of that rock and zoom in on it, you can see the fossils. This is uh, an example from New York State, and here are the fossils that are within that rock. Again, um, to understand why we have all this limestone in Illinois and elsewhere in the interior of the U.S., uh, go back to a paleogeography map, a map of the way the Earth looked in the past. And back in the Silurian, in uh, various times of the Paleozoic, the sea flooded large areas of the continental interior, Illinois was almost completely covered by seawater, and, um, but it wasn't very shallow, it was very sunny, and as a consequence, huge reefs developed in Illinois, and they're now preserved um, as limestone 
and that's what you get when you go to Thornton Court. One problem is that uh, limestone is still being formed today by modern reefs, and in some parts of the world, reefs are being blown apart for both the stone itself and also for fishing, which is, uh, given the stress that reefs are under today, is, uh, is pretty sad. Now, um, I've mentioned concrete, we, and you may know that a lot of roads are made out of concrete, sidewalks are made out of concrete, but there's another material, asphalt, um, that's used for making a lot of roads. It's the, the dark stuff. And uh, just to clarify, asphalt is also made out of aggregate, but instead of using cement as the binder, it uses bitumen, which is a, a tar-like substance from the production of oil. Um, and oil, as we'll discuss in, in the burning stuff lecture later on, um, is derived from the, the bodies of dead plankton that accumulated millions of years ago. So basically, the bitumen becomes more liquidy when it's heated up. So you, you heat it, spread it, and then flatten it. And then as it cools, it solidifies and forms a hard binder that holds the aggregate together. Again, it, it works well for roads, not so well for construction, um, but it's an alternative road making material to concrete. Okay, so we've discussed salt and clay and concrete. Uh, turn our attention to something that's not changed very much um, from its original state, and that's dimension stone. Maybe an unusual name, but basically it's the name that's used for any kind of sliced or cut block of stone that is still intact and still has the stone, original stone texture. So if you see curb stones, kitchen countertops, gravestones, building facades, these are all examples of dimension stone. How do we get it? Well, we don't, you can't use blasting like we did for, for uh, um, aggregate because that would fracture the rock and make it so it wouldn't hold together. So instead, it has to be done much more carefully. You can either split the rocks with wedges to propagate cracks and break it into two pieces. Um, you can use a, an unusual kind of saw, which is basically a wire that runs between two pulleys and sprinkle abrasive on it in water and then just grinds its way through the rock. Um, you can cut it with a really, really intense flame or cut it with a really, really intense water jet. Um, these latter two technologies are more recent. The other ones have been around for a while. So what it looks like, here's a, here's a giant saw cutting into blocks. Um, here's propagating a crack in an attack block by banging uh, wedges into it. Here's the intense fire cutting a slice into rock. And here's a, a hydraulic jet cutting into rock. Now, Active quarrying operations look something like this. Here you can see where, where all the drill holes have been put in to basically wedge the rock apart and break it into, into blocks that can then be handled. So again, there's a, a, a consequence of quarrying this rock. A place that was once a, a mountainside is now a big open pit. So, um, but people, of course, we all want stones, so, so it's a, a, a choice that we make as society. This is what a block looks like once it's been extracted. Um, usually, the, for convenience sake, the blocks are about the size of a small truck. And then they're taken in to a place where they can be cut into slices, either by giant rotating saws. And I, I should say that you'll notice that there's a lot of water around here. This is not a saw like a, a wood saw that's got uh, teeth on the edge. What this is is basically a, a rotating blade that has diamonds um, that are bonded to the edge of the blade. And so as it spins, diamonds, which are much, much harder than any mineral in stone, will grind into the stone. And the water keeps this, the, the, um, the material that's formed by grinding from accumulating, and it also keeps the saw from melting. Here's a, a, a rock that's being cut into slices. And once the slices are made, um, they could be laid down and then polished. This machine, these, these rotate around and they move back and forth and they have a grit and water on it and it creates the nice shiny polish on the surface of the stone. So that you end up, if you ever should happen to shop for stones at a, at a uh, stone store, you can go through a library of slices of stone from different parts of the world to make a, a pretty countertop or architects will use this to make pretty uh, facades for buildings or walls inside buildings. One thing is that, that in the commercial world, often you'll, you'll hear two words, granite and marble. Um, granites are not actually all granite, some are, but when you go to a store like this and, and ask to see granite, basically they're gonna show you 
any kind of rock that's made primarily of silicate minerals. These are rocks that contain SiO2 um, because that is a very hard mineral, like quartz is hard. And so um, granites, gneisses, diorites, these are all maybe less familiar rock names, but these are all kinds of rocks that you might be getting when architects would just refer to them as granite. In contrast, if somebody calls something marble, what they're talking about is a rock that's made primarily of carbonate minerals, the mineral calcite. And that can include real marble, which is a metamorphic rock made by naturally in the earth heating up limestone and causing it to recrystallize. But in some cases, it's also just limestone. Um, marble is, is not very good for countertops. It's pretty soft, but uh, people like it for, for building facades and other things like that. Um, in a modern stone factory, a computer-controlled saw will cut the stone precisely according to a program, programmed-in pattern. Um, you still have to be a little bit labor-intensive to cut out this, the holes for sinks and things like that. And then, as I mentioned, I should have had this slide a little earlier. In some cases, the stone that we see is actually polished limestone, as in the Natural History Building. Um, if you ever get a chance to go into the Natural History Building, maybe post-COVID, you'll see that there are vertical lines in the walls. That's the original bedding of the limestone. The architects decided it looked prettier being vertical. But um, what that means is these rocks were originally rotated 90 degrees to get into orientation on the, on the floor. Go up to the state capitol in, in uh, Wisconsin, and you'll see marble, which is metamorphosed limestone. You can tell the difference because often marble has these very complicated flow patterns because it was soft enough when it was being metamorphosed that it flowed very, very slowly. Now, one of the most famous marbles, of course, is the Carrera marble um, that is used by sculptors like Michelangelo. Um, it comes from a place in, called Alpiapuani in northern Italy. If we zoom in on that area from Google Earth, we can see the, the Alps, Alpiapuani, these mountains, and then this whole area. Look at the size of that area relative to the city here, or town, and you can see this whole area is white the white is exposed marble. Um, and you can see crisscrossing of roads as people have gone into this area to, to uh, dig out the marble. This is what, what it looks like. Here's, here's a, a, a saw. This is one of these wire lines where a wire is going around this and cutting into the stone. Um, and it leaves these vertical slices in the wall of the rock. Here's a person for scale. Um, and here's a statue of David for scale. David was made out of uh, Carrera marble from the marble quarry in Italy. Uh, Michelangelo would not have used this particular block because it's got a big crack in it, but he would go to this quarry or one of the nearby quarries in person to select the stone so he could make sure that they didn't have cracks so that the, the statues that he made would, would stay intact. Uh, modern uses of marble, again, go to a store and you can see slice upon slice from different parts of the world. The trade in stone slices is, is, uh, is a worldwide trade. You, you, when you look at stone like this, usually you're not looking at stone that's coming from nearby. It could be coming from the other side of the world. There are a lot of stone quarries in India, a lot of stone quarries in Brazil. Well, I guess I am going to have time for the last topic I wanted to talk about, which is sand. And uh, that's my grandson with, with sand. He's taking down that sand castle that I tried so carefully to build for him. Um, sand occurs a lot of places. Beautiful sand dunes of, of the Great Sand Dunes National Monument out, out in Colorado. Where does it come from? Again, you know, the point of this uh, building stuff, the underlying question between this series of three lectures is where this material comes from and to some extent what's involved in extracting it and using it. Well, so sand comes from small grains of minerals that come from the breakup of rocks or the breakup of shells. Now, most of the sand, the kind you see uh, um, in a sandbox, uh, the kind that's used in construction is quartz sand. That's the most widely used, which consists of tiny quartz grains. Quartz is a mineral. Um, it's SiO2, that should be a subscript. And it's, it's a very good mineral for this purpose. Uh, it's hard and durable and uh, will survive a long time without being altered by weather. Sometimes you hear black sand. That's usually composed of olivine or other dark minerals that are, are local because these minerals under longer periods of time will weather away by chemical weathering. And then along a beach in Florida or any place where the bedrock is, is um, recent limestone or recent reefs, 
you may see calcite sand, which is composed of shell fragments. Again, calcite's a weak mineral, so this stuff won't last forever. So let's just focus on quartz sand, because that's the one that, that people use. Um, it's used for lots of things. Construction, we've already talked about. Concrete, roadbeds. It's also used for glass and electronics. And more recently, it's essential for hydrofracking um, or fracking, because when fracking takes place, the idea behind fracking is to increase the permeability of rock so that the oil or gas in it can flow into a drill hole. And what that means is they pump in high pressure fluid to break apart the rock, but then so that the cracks don't just immediately close up again, that fluid contains sand. And so when the water is pumped out, the sand stays behind and props open the cracks so that the, the gas or oil can, can be extracted. Um, just to give you a sense of it, you know, you look at the average cubic meter of concrete, uh, about a, oh, not quite half of it is composed of sand. So it's used a lot in the world. There's a huge demand for sand. And in fact, that means that right now there's international trade and there's also, we're running out of sand of the right kind. And so there's a growing um, occurrence of sand piracy. And in some cases, the trade of sand has become organized crime. Uh, I mentioned that, that sand is used in glass. Basically, glass is formed when you melt the quartz and then cool it quickly or relatively quickly so crystals of quartz don't have time to form and instead you get an amorphous material and that's what glass is. You use it for bottle making and of course, for well not of course, but, but uh, 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 artists like Chihuly make absolutely spectacular glass sculpture. So where does uh, sand come from? Well, I showed this slide earlier before we were focused on the clay. But this time, look at, let's look at the residual, the stuff that's left behind, the sand. Basically, the feldspar, biotite, amphibole, they all weather to form clay, which will be washed away. Uh, I should have said quartz remains because quartz is durable. And since it's coarser grained, only when you have stronger currents will, will it be carried away. So there are a lot of environments where that will happen, along beaches, along rivers, um, places where, where the, the supply is, is available. You have to have two things. You have to have a supply of sediment that comes from the weathering of the right kind of rock, like say granite or any other rock that's got quartz grains in it. And you have to have sorting. That means you have to have an environment where moving fluids, like flowing water or wind, uh, sorts the sediment separates out the finer grains and leaves behind coarser grains or, or uh, basically uh, as a like along a river the coarse grains will be left further upstream the finer grains will be left uh, or the medium-sized grains like sand intermediate and then the fine grains get carried out into the ocean so you may start with a sediment that's very poorly sorted and as you gradually separate it you end up with well-sorted sediment and a good well-sorted sand deposit is very valuable um, I mentioned it can be sorted by any kind of running fluid or flowing fluid, including running water, uh, wave action. There's um, ripple mark sand along the, uh, at low, exposed at low tide. Here you can see the waves picking up the sand and churning it. The waves will wash the sand back and forth on the beach and carry any mud out to sea. Um, and then finally, by, by wind, here's a, a windy day in Death Valley. You can see the air is just filled with dust. That's the clay being blown away. The sand is here on the ground, piling into dunes. Now, where does the sand in Illinois come from? We don't have, uh, you know, uh, big dunes like in, in, well, maybe up in Indiana, but we don't have sand dunes like the Sahara, and we don't have um, beaches like, like uh, along the Caribbean coast. A lot of our sand comes from Pleistocene deposits where nature separated the sand forest out of glacial sediment, or what's called glacial till. Now, what glacial till is, is when ice is flowing in a glacier, it carries rock and sediment of any size, because ice is basically solid. It's a soft solid, so it flows, but it, carry, it can carry even big boulders. So when a glacier melts away, it leaves behind what's called glacial till, which is a mixture of fine sediment and coarse sediment. So here are big blocks suspended in a mixture of clay, silt, and, and, and sand. Now, most of you probably know that, that Illinois was covered by glaciers during the last ice age. And 
that means that our part of the world was an area where when the glaciers melted away, they deposited a lot of glacial sediment. But going back to that picture of glacial sediment, we can't use that sediment directly because it's got all that other stuff mixed into it. Take a lot of energy and time and effort to separate out the sand. So we go to places where nature's done it for us. And this is a place called an outwash deposit. It's where meltwater streams from the Pleistocene glaciers carry, wash through the glacial till and gradually separated it out into sand layers and then uh, gravel layers, maybe another sand layer. I'd have to show a picture of a, of a stream, and I, I realized I left that out by mistake, to show uh, the different places. But you can imagine this, oops, you can imagine this layer as being a gravel bar, and then this layer being the sand uh, where the water's um, flowing a little bit more slowly. Another place is a funny structure called an esker, which is basically the deposit inside a tunnel, a meltwater tunnel under a glacier. So here's that esker after the glacier melts away. And here's what it looks like, and you bulldoze into it, and you get sand. So you get sand in sand dunes and coastal areas, uh, a lot of places around the world, but the right sand with the right composition doesn't occur everywhere. So that means that where it does occur, major industrial scale operations are collecting it. Here's a place where sand dunes are being quarried. Here's a place where a beach is being quarried. And of course, you look at this and you realize, obviously the people need the sand um, because there's a market for it, they're selling it and they're making their living by doing this, but it's not gonna be very long before that beach is gone. And so sand is, is actually very, sand quarrying can be very destructive to coastal environments. This is another example of, of quarrying sand, major operations. Um, it ends up getting sorted into different size fractions, such as here, and then used. Um, one other thing about Illinois is some of our sand, in fact, this is sand that's, that's exported to be used in fracking, comes from hundreds of millions of years old or addition deposits of sand that were then buried and turned into a, a rock called sandstone. But this particular sandstone is weak enough that it's very easily crushed and broken down and so, in, but it's very, very pure quartz sand. So people have been quarrying it and crushing it and then turning it into sand to be used for fracking. So I'll finish by, by uh, you know, just summarizing by pointing out that, that the stuff that we use for building, in our, the, the materials that make up our built environment, all mostly come from the earth. Um, anytime you see a material like that, you know, ranging from brick to a, a glass window to um, a stone monument to a concrete block, you have to keep in mind that it takes special conditions for that material to form and to concentrate it in some place in, a, in an economic reserve. And that extracting it has an environmental cost, uh, processing it has an environmental cost, and using it has an environmental cost, both for our environment and for the climate. So I think I'll stop there and, and take any questions. Uh, thanks very much. Hi, folks. We're going to begin unmuting you. Please uh, either raise your hands or you are welcome to use the Q&A function if you prefer to type in any questions you might have. I'm not seeing or hearing anything, so I guess... Oh, okay. Somebody raised a hand, but I don't know what to do about that. I guess I asked. Oops. No. How do I, how do I respond to somebody who raised a hand? Because uh, I clicked on it and clicked on the person and she went away. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll, we'll work on uh, getting... Uh, Good afternoon. And... Hello? Hi, I hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I'm sorry, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Just I uh, have a question. May, how much can affect uh, the fact of um, extract uh, like uh, sand or some minerals in order to um, make uh, this concrete? Because nowadays we use a lot of concrete in our buildings. So uh, what would be the, the suggestion? Maybe we need to to change materials, I don't know, because um, 
very few people use like um, uh, like just clay uh, or just uh, um, like natural materials in order to be to do buildings. Right. So, so the problem with sand is that a lot of it is being extracted from places where the environment, local environment, can't really bear the loss. So, for example. Um, if you take too much of it out of a river, it changes the way the river flows and can cause erosion and damage to communities on the side. If you take it too much from a beach, it can, can, uh, can end up uh, allowing for more erosion and more storm damage during, during storms. So the solution that people have come up with, there's really no substitute for concrete because it's so strong and durable. Um, but the solution might be to seek other sources of sand that are more abundant and then figure out ways to process that sand to uh, make it into the right size fraction or have the right uh, roughness to be used for concrete. The thing about, about uh, sand used in concrete is it's, it's best when it's got somewhat irregular edges and the sand that comes in windblown sand dunes tends to be too smooth. But if you were to take that sand or take recycled glass bottles and crush that material into the right size fraction with the right edges, that could be perhaps used as a substitute for uh, for the sand that's being quarried from places that where it's environmentally damaging. Uh, we have a question from Nishant, I believe, who raised a hand. Hey, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, uh, Professor Marshak, uh, thanks a lot for your uh, really, really enlightening talk. Uh, this is Nishant Gar from CE. I work on cements. Um, one thing, you know, what, what is happening in the cement community is obviously, you know, as you pointed out, you know, the CO2 emissions, which are, you know, large part of is coming from uh, when we calcine uh, limestone and, and, you know, forgetting the calcium, um, and that is becoming more and more important with the, with the bigger CO2 footprint. Um, we're always looking for, you know, other ways to, you know, let's say make cement or, or have, a, have a green it in concrete. From a geological point of view, are there are there options or, or, or sources of maybe calcium we could look at to, to you know, make these uh, cements or maybe other materials that people are not looking? Uh, good question. I'm not, I, I'm not really aware of any. The reason that, that limestone is used is, first of all, it's very abundant. And secondly, the, the process of processing it is, is quite easy. You just have to cook it. And so it does take energy, but it doesn't require any chemical processing. There's no, uh, there are no um, you know, bad waste products that come out of it. It doesn't contain, it's, it's processing is not so bad for, for uh, water contamination and things like that. So right now, as far as I'm aware, um, limestone is really the main source. Of course, there are a lot of other things, um, and I know that there's a lot of research on concrete at the University of Illinois. Um, you know, you can put things into the concrete to, um, to reinforce it, to make it more uh, resistant to fracturing and cracking and so forth. Uh, but I'm not an expert. I, I just don't know if there's anything that you can use to substitute for the lime. I mean, lime um, has always been a, an essential component of it, and the main place for that is, is, uh, is limestone. There are other minerals, like some feldspars, for example, contain calcium, but uh, extracting calcium from those minerals would just be prohibitively expensive energy-wise and would have all sorts of other um, associated problems. Uh, Thank you. Uh, so, uh, uh, Professor Marshak, we have a question from Academy High School, actually. Um, and they ask, for our high school students at Academy High in Champaign, can you elaborate briefly on how you came to be in your field? Oh, boy, that's gone back several decades. <laughs> <laughs> actually, it was when I was in high school. And uh, I, I uh, signed up to go on, an, on a trip to go cave, cave exploring that uh, a uh, a service club was offering to, to uh, high school students in the city I lived in. And uh, I thought that was very neat. And uh, so while we were riding in the bus, um, a couple of the kids sitting behind me that I didn't know, they were talking about how one of them had a father who was a, had geology as a hobby and wasn't it neat, he could identify rocks. And so I just, you know, sparked my interest. And, and uh, so I decided to take a course in it when I, was, uh, when I went to college. I hadn't planned on being a geologist. I didn't really know that there, there was such a thing. Um, and I just got interested in them and uh, switched, switched to be a geology major in college and then uh, have, have just done it ever since. Okay, we have a question, a couple of questions from Eric Boyer. Uh, he says, sand is apparently very valuable. What about the deserts in Africa? Are people pirating sand from there? Um, 
right now, that's not so much of a problem. Um, as I mentioned a, a second ago, the sand is not always the best, the best quality for construction purposes because of its smoothness. Um, and, but my guess is that probably in the, in the uh, near future, people are going to figure out ways to use that sand more. And so it may be a problem more in the future. Right now, the major challenges are in Africa and, and Southern Asia, uh, particularly in India and, and China and other countries where there's just been a vast amount of construction. If you look at, you know, you're probably familiar with, the, with photographs of, of skylines in China that are, are sprouting huge skyscrapers um, by the dozen, literally, by the, by, the, by, by the hundreds. And these buildings are all made of concrete. So the demand for the material is just immense. And, um, and the other thing is that, that in many places, space for cities is, is running out. So people are, are um, setting up systems where they pump sand from underwater just to, to build new land so that cities can spread out into, into landfill. And so it's, it's not just concrete, but also other uses of sand. And so uh, the, the demand has is, is created uh, um, an extreme case of, of uh, need in those parts of the world. Excellent. We have uh, two more questions. A comment from Carla saying we shouldn't be exploiting Africa anymore. And then she asked, uh, she thanked you for the talk and said, very interesting for people who come from language fields to learn more about how stuff is made. My question, in addition to concrete, what other materials should be substituted or changed in order to help the environment? Have you heard about house domes? Could this be a good alternative? No, I haven't heard about house domes. I'm, I'm not sure what they are. Um, I don't really have a good answer for that. I, I think that, that a solution would be to figure out ways to better use recycled materials. Um, you know, the, the demand for material is, is intense and a lot of it is used once and it ends up in landfills or, or uh, in other places. And if there were ways to, to say, increase the proportion of plastic, for example, recycled plastic and concrete, that would, that would decrease the demand for, for that material. Um, and that, that's the kind of answers that I could come up with. Um, but I think it's, a, it's an area that's, that's ripe for considering. Um, the other, and I'll just add one other point, the other thing would be to utilize space more efficiently, like for example, efforts at the University of Illinois to try not to expand by building too many more buildings unless you're replacing um, existing space. Because in many cases, buildings, especially in industrialized, are not being utilized um, very efficiently. So there's, there's really probably more space than's needed and, and uh, the stuff there, the buildings are being built when they necessary, aren't necessarily needed. It's gonna be really, well, interesting, I guess is the word, but, but uh, a challenge to post COVID society to understand whether in, in, uh, in the future ways that buildings are going to be used, whether there's, there's going to be a need for so much more construction. Thank you, Professor Marshak. We have a question from Brad Klein. Brad, if you would like to unmute yourself and ask a question, that would be fine. Great, thank you. Uh, terrific presentation, very informative. One of the things that I, uh, I had two items. One is uh, the CO2 that's produced in making cement, is there, uh, have there been uh, any sort of uh, research or pilot projects to try to do that, say with a solar concentrator or to uh, use geothermal in order to heat the material up? Well, the, um, you know, the, the question of, of where the energy source comes from is in some ways a different issue. That's like, like uh, the issue of, of um, you know, alternative power. Uh, obviously, it's going to, to decrease the carbon footprint because that power will not have used carbon. But um, in terms of the production of cement, there have been efforts to do carbon capture and sequestration um, from the effluent coming out of, of cement production because it is fairly concentrated and localized. And the idea behind that is you capture the, the, the fumes, uh, concentrate it into, a, or, or cool it so that it becomes liquid form, and then inject it into very, very deep holes underground um, where presumably it infiltrates into the, into the pore spaces within the rock and stays down there. Um, the carbon capture and sequestration remains a controversial subject because uh, whether or not it really solves the problem or just delays it by a few decades or a few centuries um, remains something that people are struggling to understand. 
Okay. Uh, my second question had to do with fly ash that is sometimes uh, used to replace, I believe, sand in the concrete mixture. Mm -hmm. uh, fly ash being a waste product from uh, coal power, fired power plants. Um, is that something that's uh, a, a real option for, for reducing the amount of sand used? Uh, I don't know about sand. I think that the Fly ash is used more um, to replace aspects of the aggregate, but um, I sh I, I'll have to look into that a little bit more. I, I neglected to really discuss very much about how fly ash is used, but you're right. With things like cinder blocks and so forth, you know, the, the main component of those uh, in some cases is, is ash from, the, from other industrial processes. And uh, there, uh, there are a lot of products that come out of, of coal burning that are used. For example, um, the sulfur that comes out of coal burning and is then captured uh, can be processed and turned into gypsum to make wallboard instead of using natural gypsum. So um, there, there are uh, pluses and minuses to, to uh, other resources that can be re repurposed in order to substitute for natural materials and, and construction materials. It's a very good point you've made. Okay, we have time for one more question. It comes from Rhea. Uh, what are some ecological consequences of claiming land from the sea, in parentheses, using sand? Well, um, the, the question, any time there's landfill that's, that's claiming land from the sea, basically what you're doing is, is trans, transforming a marine environment into a terrestrial environment. And that's decreasing the, at least temporarily, the marine environment unless it reestablishes itself further offshore. So um, the problem, though, is that in many cases, the places where landfill is taking place is not so much like in the open, open ocean or along open shorelines, but in wetlands. And so basically, there's, there's no easy way to replace those wetlands. So the main ecological um, problem that, that comes to my mind, again, I'm not an expert on it, is the, the destruct is wetland destruction because of wetlands being transformed by piling in sand and other debris uh, to make make more of an area for construction. All right. Well, uh, thanks to everyone for participating in this extremely interesting, uh, uh, informative talk, the first in our three-part series on where stuff comes from. So thanks, uh, thanks to us, um, your listeners, and from IC for, for, for presenting, uh, Steve. We really appreciate it. Uh, and I want to remind everyone that um, this is the first in a three-part series and Steve's second lecture will be coming up on Tuesday, October the 27th. So mark that in your calendars. Same time, uh, 12 noon, Tuesday, October the 27th. And in this lecture, attention will turn to precious stuff, the discovery, extraction and use of valuable materials from gems to smartphones. So please join us again in a month's time to see the second in, in Steve's uh, three-part lecture series on where stuff comes from. But for now, uh, for now we're signing off from IC. Thanks again, Steve. Take care. Thank you. It's been fun. Bye-bye.